Hello? <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Um, really, so I'm going to hand over to Colin, who's going to sit here and chair, <laughs> and chair the discussion. Are going to cheer us up? <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, I knew I was going to chair this about 10 seconds ago, so bear with me. Um, do you want to ask for all the comments, or should we? Yeah. Um, is there anything you want to say, Christine, before we go to the speakers? Okay. Um, we had two speakers, Dr. Bob Gill, who I'm sure you saw in the film, and Dr. Paul Hogday, who has a book at the back if you want to buy one. Um, but who would like to go first, Paul or, or Bob? I'm good Paul's first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can do that right. Um, at first. See if you can all hear me. Yes? Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you for inviting me, Christine. Yeah. I'm, I'm Paul Hobday. I was a GP in Kent for 30 years or so. Um, let me start with this. Rob was an experienced GP who was beginning to get increasingly despairing and upset about the extra illness and pathology he saw on a daily basis. He realised this was a direct result of government policies, all governments. Rob became a doctor and a GP because of the NHS. He never wanted to work in any other system. But to see it being dismantled and obstacles put in the way of his efforts to help people made him very angry. It took him a long time to re recognize and understand the long-term clandestine plan to commercialize healthcare so that a small group can make their fortunes. Now, I've just read the first paragraph of the synopsis of this this massive great book that uh, is called The Deceit Syndrome, which was written for one purpose only, and that was to get the message across to the public about how our NHS is being Americanised. Rob could be me, it could be Bob here, it could be any GP, I think. And this really should be a bigger issue than um, Brexit, but it is largely ignored by the media. So why did I, as a GP, who had never written anything before except prescriptions, come to produce such a massive book, and why? Basically because I was desperate. Like others here, I had tried my best to alert people to what was happening in their NHS. I dabbled in medical politics and national, all to no avail. There have been demonstrations, there have been songs, there have been plays, campaigns, stand-up events, comic events, and films like the one you've just seen. More films to come, even t-shirts, even badges like the ones at the back for sale. And nothing has changed the course of events one jot. So, not knowing, what, not knowing what else to do, in desperation I wrote this novel. Although it's fiction, all that has happened and is happening in the NHS is in it. And all that is factual. Hopefully it's a bit of, a bit of entertainment as well, because otherwise nobody's going to bother reading it. And that is the end of my plug, I promise you. <laughs> well, apart from saying all the proceeds go to campaigns fighting for our NHS, like the great one you've got here on the island. This book has a lot of history in it too, and I'd like to take you through some of it. Bob will follow up after me um, to, about where we're heading. So I'm the past, Bob's the future. And how did we get here today? Well. Let's go back to 1988. In 1988, there were three publications which would determine the fate of our NHS. The first was called Britain's Biggest Enterprise, Ideas for Radical Reform of the NHS, by Conservatives Oliver Letwin and John Redwood. Then there was Privatising the World, a book by Oliver Letwin. And lastly, but not least, The Health of Nations from the Adam Smith Institute. This was all they were all published at the height of Thatcherism, and behind the scenes, the plot against the NHS was being formulated. But actually, the NHS has never been safe. I estimate that of the 71 years the NHS has existed, only about 11 of those years have we had governments that have truly believed in Bevin's founding principles. The other 60 years, we've been ruled by those who are at best lukewarm to the NHS, and at worst, wanted to end a terrible bit of socialism. Hence the chronic underfunding, and in the last 30 years, the slow clandestine dismantling process. 
to me, it's actually amazing it has survived this long. At its conception, the BMA voted 9 to 1 against it. One former chairman of the BMA described the proposals as like the first step and a big one to National Socialism as practiced in Germany. The Conservatives under Winston Churchill voted against the National Health Act 21 times in Parliament. The right-wing press was opposed to the idea of the National Health Service with editorials like the State Medical Service is part of the socialist plot to convert Great Britain into a national socialist economy. Actually, thus comparing those that wanted the, an NHS with Nazis. And you think things are bad now. <laughs> an organisation called the Fellowship for Freedom in Medicine, a classic front organisation, was set up and secretly backed by the international insurance industry and fronted by doctors. Most noticeably, Lord Horder, who was the King's doctor. <coughs> After a year or two, a right-wing Labour Chancellor, Hugh Gateskill, introduced legislation for charges for dentures and spectacles. Bevin famously resigned uh, over this betrayal as a result. However, it was the next Conservative government in 1952 that introduced prescription charges and then more dental charges. In 1953, they set up the Gillibo Inquiry, fully expecting and hoping the Cambridge Academic to report that the NHS was unaffordable and give it an excuse to, to squash it in its infancy. Much to their annoyance, Gillibo, Gillibo concluded the NHS was actually very effective and the only thing needed, needed more money. But that didn't stop them. Between 1958 and 1960, Macmillan's government had plans drawn up by the civil servants for a fully contributory NHS. In other words, back to the ill being penalised for being ill. A few of the 11 good years that I mentioned followed, with um, Harold Wilson abolishing prescription charges in 1965 and rejuvenating general practice. But his enemies were not about to give up. In 1968, Arthur Sheldon, the co-founder of the Right Wing Institute for Economic Affairs, which you hear a lot about in the media now, um, and the architect of both Thatcherism and Blairism, wrote a pamphlet, pamphlet called After the NHS, How to Introduce an Insurance-Based System in the UK. He said to improve the NHS, we need to abolish it and provide profit opportunities in health insurance. Then in the early 1970s, Ted Heath's Health Minister, Keith Joseph, was the first to invite management consultants in. Enter McKinsey, an American company who are still heavily influencing policy today. In the early years of Margaret Thatcher's government, a report by the Central Policy Review staff recommended compulsory private health insurance, a system of private medical facilities and increased charges. Thatcher, Geoffrey Howe, her Chancellor, and other right-wingers were all in favour, but they were shouted down in, and I quote, the nearest thing to a cabinet riot, according to memoirs and cabinet papers recently released. And this led to the hollow promise of the, uh, the 1983 uh, party conference that the NHS is safe with us. Despite this, Margaret Thatcher secretly tried to press ahead with plans to dismantle the welfare state and what effectively meant the end of the NHS. As I say, this is all in the Cabinet Papers as a matter of record. She tasked Roy Griffiths, head of Sainsbury's, to produce a report. The conclusion required was made clear in advance. They had learned from their mistake 30 years over, uh, earlier with the Gillibo report. This radicalised <coughs> NHS management. The NHS should be run like supermarkets, concluded the supermarket boss. <laughs> Strengthened by another election victory in 1987, Mrs. Thatcher delighted with those three publications of 1988 that I mentioned, and they became the blueprint for what has happened in the last 30 years under governments of all colours. They knew the dismantling had to be clandestine, devious and piecemeal. They called it salami slicing, done in small steps so no one would recognise the whole picture until it was too late. As the Conservative MP Oliver Letwin wrote in 1988, it will be electoral suicide to transform the NHS into an insurance-based system in a single leap, but it could be achieved in co covert clandestine stages.
his words. One could begin, for example, he wrote, with the establishment of an NHS as an independent trust, with increased joint ventures between the NHS and the private sector, and only at the last stage switch to an insurance scheme. Note that, only at the last stage switch to an insurance scheme. It has been developed a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, piece by malignant piece. So the full picture and, and what they are basically up to wouldn't be clear until the last piece has been laid. It took, actually took me a long time to appreciate what was going on. And I, I'm, I was somebody who was living with it day in, day out. So it's not surprising few others are aware. And of course, it continues to be denied. First, we got competitive tendering under Margaret Thatcher, outsourcing, catering, cleaning, management, and residential care. Uh, but the real commercialisation got going in 1991 with the purchase of provider split and the internal market introduced by Ken Clark. Remember him? <laughs> the first clinical services were outsourced, their euphemism for privatised, under labour by Alan Mil Milburn against an election pledge. More salami, salami slicing came along with Simon Stevens' NHS 2000 plan, introducing a further raft of privatisation reforms. Stevens, Stevens kicked down on the accelerator and then left for America to join United Health. This basic plan has guided the British establishment ever since. Much of this has been masterminded by McKinsey, the US management consultants. Some MPs have actually worked for them. Many other key, key players have gone through the revolving door of the NHS to private companies, back to the NHS to private companies and so forth. By the NHS boss, Mark Bricknell, went to KPMG and he was quoted as saying, in future the NHS will be a state insurance provider, not a deliverer. Alan Milburn, Secretary of State for quite a few years, went straight to Bridgeport Capital and financed private healthcare firms moving into the NHS. Not forgetting his jobs with PricewaterhouseCooper and uh, Lloyd's Pharmacy. Patricia Hewitt went straight to a lucrative job with Boots. John Reed worked, worked, worked for T4S, who, surprise, surprise, now run Amulet Services. Not to, the list goes on, but I won't bore you too much. Lansley, well, he's joined private companies as well. These are the people who orchestrated the other necessary but often subtle moves, plenty of which you've, I think, seen in the film. Starting with turning hospitals into businesses called trusts outsourcing to private businesses operating under the NHS logo, buying in services such as hip replacement surgery from the private sector at inflated prices, the introduction of independent sector treatment centres, the 2012 Health and Social Care Act making tendering compulsory, the running down of general practice, 583 practices have closed in the last six years, um, these figures are a bit old, so maybe more than that, 138 in the last year. 138 general practices closing, disappearing. Loading trusts with unmanageable PFI debts, you saw that in the film, so that it could be claimed cuts and closures were unavoidable, whilst Carillion got a 50% return on their investment. It was all in set off, and it's worth repeating that for every one PFI hospital, three publicly funded hospitals could have been built. £11 billion pounds of assets will cost the taxpayer £88 billion. Pounds. Then part of the other changes. Changing the law so that hospitals can go bust. Introducing personal budgets. Now these are necessary for the introduction of a private insurance based system. The grab of confidential data for insurance companies. And believe me, some of your private data is with insurance companies now. Turning doctors from decision makers to decision implementers. Now that's important because although doctors are only a small proportion of the NHS workforce, they account for about 80% of the nation's health spend. So their plan was power has to be taken away from doctors. So they make them implementers, not decision makers. Setting up 44 STPs, which I'm sure you've now heard of, uh, to ration and cut services. Closed hospitals and departments reduced A&E from about 140 in England down to seven, between 40 and 70. 
40 when you get away from it. The nice 48, there were 480,000 beds in the NHS. We're down to 120,000, and they want to cut it by another 20,000 to get it down to 100,000. So the beds have gone down to a fifth of what they were, while the population has gone up by a third. Then there was the Naylor report, some of you may have heard about that. A massive transfer of NHS assets into private hands, giving away our land to private companies on the cheap. And they're using this money to set up some of the schemes that Bob will uh, probably brush on later. Allowing a staff shortage to develop to justify closing units and using less qualified staff. It's happened in my area, in Kent. By not recruiting staff, they say, well, we can't staff this unit, therefore the unit has to close. It's a, it's a great circle. And of course, when they announce the unit's going to close, the existing staff leave. So it's, it's not something that can be reversed. Demoralising staff, well, of course they're demoralised with all that lot. Um, and separating the NHS from government. Have you noticed how the BBC now says the NHS failed in this? The NHS was at fault with that. It's never the government now, as of course it should be. And the propaganda and smear campaign. There are too many of us that are elderly, fat, smokers, too many immigrants. We can't afford an NHS. It's all rubbish. It's all propaganda. But these are some of the ideas that were laid out in that third publication, The Health of Nations. Uh, and they've been adopted. This was in 1988. Sections four to six in it, if you want to get it out of the library, um, contain a clear description of the various elements of the new Labour and coalition reforms of the NHS, moving to an insurance-based healthcare system, with over 200 parliamentarians benefiting financially from privatisation and with their fingers in private healthcare company, uh, companies, they were pushing at an open door. The the Conservative Party in opposition in 2005 pushed their policies further with more publications, one called Direct Democracy, which is hard to get hold of now because they're slightly nervous about people like me standing up and talking about it, <laughs> which stated in the chapter on health that the NHS, the structure, is no longer relevant in the 21st century. We should break down the barriers between private and public provision, in effect denationalising the provision of healthcare in Britain their words. We should fund patients by way of universal insurance to purchase health care from the provider of their choice. Those without means would have their contributions supplemented or paid for by the state. Hmm. Good of them. Then, um, of course, you remember all of that being discussed in the media, don't you? I mean, it's all over the media all the time, all that sort of stuff. Who were the authors of that? Well, Jeremy Hunt was one at the Health Secretary for six uh, years. Greg Clark, recently a cabinet minister of my MP, he was another author. And ministers in Boris Johnson's government uh, were authors as well. Michael Gove, Quasi Quartang, they put their names to those policies. And they were in obviously government. The Liberals in coalition were happy to go along with all this. David Laws proposed that the NHS should be replaced with the National Health Insurance Scheme that would include a plethora of providers competing for the custom of empowered patients. Anyway, I, I digress. Back to, the, back to the jigsaw. All the pieces were being sorted into place, so now they needed to bring back from the US the man to finish the job. Re-enter Simon Stevens after his 10 years with United Health. Do you know what his job with United Health was? Head of Global Expansion. Now that says it all, doesn't it? Head of Global Expansion of United Health is now running our health service. <coughs> and his first act on return in 2014 was introduced his five-year forward review. Didn't get much criticism from any political party. Everybody seemed to think, oh, well, that sounds good. But this is a masterpiece of deluding propaganda, promoting and fragmenting uh, promoting the fragmented US models as wonderful joined up integrated care. <laughs> Essentially, the five year forward review is about two things. It's about destroying traditional NHS structures, destroying staffing norms, and getting rid of assets. And secondly, it's to impose new US style models and payment systems. Big business wants the industrial 